Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Tyranny with me, Bring It On. Uh, so the plan is to finish speaking to Lantry and then speak to Eb this episode. But we'll see just how much talking it actually is. Uh, uh, one moment, my friend. Just let... Of course. How can I help? I am nothing if not a semi-reliable font of knowledge. Uh, what did you want to discuss? I'd like to discuss arcane matters. And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since the fall of the Vellum Citadel, it is hard to find someone with whom I can discuss such things. Uh, what do you know of Kairos's edicts? Uh, Kairos has cast many over the ages, and to my knowledge has never worded two edicts exactly the same. Edicts defy our understanding of magic. Kairos's magic works over vast distances, over indefinite durations, and no Archon of Mir or Mirror Mage can counter the force of an edict. And what can you tell of edicts in general? I explain to my student I explain it to my students like this. A spell is to an edict as a drop of rain is to a hurricane. Edicts and spells are both magical cantrips, but differ in intensity by orders of magnitude. Edicts are almost commands to Tyrannus that must be carried out until the instructions allow for the magic to end. If Kairos wants a plague to until next Judge's Day, expect copious bubos until next Judge's Day. And nothing is ever dispelled in edict, nothing outside of the edict's own sunset clause, as I like to think of them. I'm curious about a specific edict. Of course, ask away. Uh, any thoughts on the edict of execution cast on the Vendrin's Valley? It seems like the Archons are about to kill each other, and the threat of mutual destruction was about all Kairos had left. Imagine fear is the only way to get someone like the voice of Nerat to follow orders, and the edict certainly did whip them into action. Uh, what do you know of the Edict of Stone? The Edict of Stone ravages the realm of Azur. The upheaval of earth and rock turned the rolling plains into a craggy step known as the Stone Sea. Since the Edict was directed at the traitorous Archon of Stone, it would seem the upheaval of Azur was a secondary consequence, though I imagine little of what Kairos does is unintentional. And what do you know of the Edict of Fire? I was there when the ground erupted with fire, and I don't think I remember ever being as terrified as I was that day. If I hadn't woken early, I'd have likely perished in my sleep, or woken to the experience of being immolated. I have very conflicted feelings about this matter. The School of Ink and Quill had every opportunity to surrender. The leadership chose to stand against the most powerful force on Tyrannus. While all this is very terrible, it was entirely preventable. You'll think me crazy. There is a part of me saddened I lived through an edict of fire. Kairos has used this before. I figure if I'm going to have years taken off my life fleeing an edict, it would have been nice if it was a historical first. Can you tell me of the Edict of Storms? I think you know more than most on the subject. I watched with great interest when it happened, but fleeing the Edict of Fire was a more pressing concern. The Edict of Storms turned the once forested lands of Stalwart into a wind-swept wasteland. They call it the Blade Grave now, since only the iron and bronze armaments remain. A hurricane breezes, rust winds, and relentless lightning have destroyed the housing and farmlands. Now, do edicts work on the same pr arcane principles as spellcraft and other magic? Edicts are the strongest manifestation of magic we know, and they seem to violate all other lesser phenomena. No dispel cantrip has ever dented or abated an edict. Even Archons, with powers of great durability, cannot shrug off their effects. Uh, just look at Cairn. Now, what I find curious, edicts can flex a little. Or so my studies suggest this is the case. Take the Edict of Storms. While the day it was proclaimed was the most violent, the actual radius of the storm has changed over time. Uh, but most will have none of my hypotheses on this matter. All right, fine, I'll take the bait. What's your conjecture about edicts? So, in my studies, some edicts resolve some problem of the overlords and then vanish into history. But the edicts that linger around, almost all of them begin to widen. Their effects become more intense. Here's the intriguing part. The older the edict, and the more that's written about it, the more the reports of that edict get more dire over time. Uh, perhaps edicts have a life of their own once set in motion. Something to that effect, at least. I contend that edicts are powered by fear. Fear of Kairos helps fuel the casting, and fear of the edict feeds the magic, sustaining it, and if enough people fear it, even growing it a bit. 
War Edict just feeds off the landscape once set in motion. Look what has become of Azir and Stalwart. I thought just that. But wherever an edict is cast or has been cast, the land will always hum with a little background noise. If your ears trained to listen. If anything, it seems edicts add more magic into the world, not the other way around. Well, that's interesting. And that gives more credence, more credence to Kairos' power. Like he's not pulling from others, some other source. He's actually creating the magic. As far as I understand. Intellectual honesty demands that I study the matter more. If I'm correct, the more people fear and obsess over an edict, the stronger it becomes. Anyway, another study for another time. Hmm. Just like Sigil. And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since the fall of the Vellum Citadel, it is hard to find someone with whom I can discuss such things. Uh, what do you know of the magic of the Archons? I've studied many of the Archons for many years. Compared to the other sages, I'm an expert on the subject. Which is sad, because I feel like I've still so much to learn. How does the magic of Archons work? The Archons all have magical powers that are intuitive. When the voice of Nerat pulls out someone's mind, or Graven Ash protects his soldier, that magic isn't a sign, spell, or ritual. To them, it's closer to flexing one's hand. Archons are the... what's the word for it? Axiom of magic. The root of magic. Spell pioneers. I'm sure this analogy is off in many ways, but I see Archons as the mothers of original magic, and everyone else is just imitating them. So while every guild or school of magic will ascribe a different name to the theory, all mages inevitably stumble upon an ines inescapable fact. Only the Archons will magic into being. Everyone else can only cast magic by invoking the sigil of an Archon that has come before. I know how the Archons do their magic. It seems to be different with each Archon. But theory suggests that once an Archon starts to invoke their powers, anyone else who comes after that Archon could, with the proper knowledge, tap into that power with the proper sigil and know-how. This observed law has given rise to a common question from young students. Could one guess that a sigil of an Archon not yet born, or not remembered by history, or simply unknown to the caster, and successfully cast a spell? Experienced mystics would tell you this is, not, is impossible, for they know that it's not enough to just mimic the gestures of a sigil, we must have willful, conscious knowledge of the Archon and the intended power being channeled. Uh, to confuse things a bit, some Archons learn to cast other spells in the same fashion as us lesser mages. If you're as important as an Archon, you learn quick that all knowledge is power. I've s okay. Uh, are our Archons loyal to Kairos? Officially, yes. In actuality, no. Those with a true grip for magic always come to the attention of Kairos. A few managed to evade attention for a bit. Well, the School of Tides was founded by one such uncontrollable, but these are history's exceptions. A cult of Jade, Archon of Tides never bowed to Kairos. It said she survived the assassin sent to silence her. It makes her flight from Kairos before the war all the more troubling. We knew her as this symbol of strength, but when threatened, her weaker nature won. When we write biographies of the Archons, we often refer to them as exarchs in their formative years before stepping into their prime. But officially, Kairos is supposed to grant all titles of Archon. It's quite a faux pas to self appellate Exactly why Jade insisted on calling herself Archon of Tides. She didn't need Kairos' approval to wear the title she deserves. Not only she loved the fact that doing so must have annoyed Kairos. Uh, how's an Archon born, or bred? I think we all dream of one day waking up and being an Archon. Given some of the madmen and loons that have exhibited mystical greatness, it can seem unfair that the rest of us can't do it. I can say with confidence Archons aren't born, they become. A Graven Ash is a good study of this. Before he was the Archon of War, he was a sexual commander, each victory more daring and glorious than the next. Now, somewhere along the way, his leadership took on mystical qualities. The Graven Ash we know today can reach out and project his, protect his soldiers from harm. But maybe at first, he could just protect those near him. I wouldn't know for certain, but all will attest that he didn't have this power his whole life. So based off that, and then what he said about fear powering Kairos' edicts, it seems like belief might have a strong say in the matter, I guess as far as like magical authority or power goes. But 
then that begs the question, like, who believed in the voice of Narad? And how did he come across his power? Unless, of course, Scraven Ash always had that power inherently, but as people started to believe in him as a commander, it grew in, in power. So maybe there is some, some independence to the magic, but then once, like, belief will fuel it even further. I've studied many of the Archons. Oh, no, I've never read that. All right, uh, something else. And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since the fall of the Vellum Citadel, it is hard to find someone with whom I can discuss such things. Uh, what do you know of spellcraft? <laughs> I've forgotten more than most blood chanters have ever learned. What do you want to know? Uh, can you teach me anything? I think you know all I can teach you. Uh, what sort of magic did the sages teach you? Sages send into me in the traditional sigils. Those of preservation, concealment, and healing, as derived uh, from the bygone archons of Thravis, Fading Wrath, and the Orphan Midwife. The preservation magic is largely functional, sealing parchment, bonding books, that sort of thing. All of us chroniclers learn concealment magic, as our ideal method would be to study events without contaminating the decisions being made. As for the healing magic, many of us modern sages study this a great deal. The school has a shoddy reputation among the common folk, I figure if they knew us as healers and caregivers, maybe we start to change opinions. Healing, healing, that's a noble craft to study. True, but given how accident prone I can be, I think the person that benefits most from my magic is me. But certainly, the most gratifying spells I know are the ones that ease pain and suffering. They make me feel slightly useful. Now right, what can you tell me about signing magic? Scholars don't have a good word for what Archons do when they cast magic. I couldn't tell you how Graven Ash casts his protection over his soldiers, nor would I know how Blood and Mark consciously decides to move through a shadow. A Blood and Mark, or Bleeden, I want to say Bleeden, uh, is Kairos' knife in the shadows, the unseen drop of poison that enforces the Overlord's will. He reports to Tunan the Adjudicator, serving in his capacity as the final word to those who hold Kairos' law in contempt. If you know the origin of if you know the origin of the Archon of Shadows, or how Kairos maintains a hold on him, those who anger the Archon never live long past sunset. When us mere mages want to cast a spell, we do so by signing the sigil of an Archon that previously discovered the magical phenomenon in question. Uh, it's debated whether Archons create new magic or just discover magic that was waiting for us. But such questions seem impossible to answer while sober. <laughs> And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since the fall of the Vellum Citadel, it is hard to find someone with whom I can discuss such things. Are you familiar with the old walls? Familiar is a relative term. I think I know more than most, but it's a subject of mystery, even to the scholars. Though, I must admit, in addition to my reading, I ventured into the old walls on occasion, and soiled many undergarments in the process. <laughs> uh. Do you know who built them or why? We can only seem to agree that they were built. There's no consensus as to the who of it. We generally use the old realms or older realms when describing the folk that must have done all of this construction ages ago. That's also where the young realms got their name, indirectly. Azur, Stalwart, and all of them older than you and all of them are older than you and I, but compared to the old walls, they're babies. As for the why, that's anybody's guess. I've always assumed it's an ancient road and aqueduct network. Excuse me, network. If you just needed to fence off your neighbors, you wouldn't have such elaborate, expansive masonry on the inside. Uh, what sorts of things have you seen in the old walls? Aside from the terrifying bane, well, every section of the old walls has its own jaw-dropping architecture. I've seen bridges that move when someone is near, mystical barriers that must have been standing for eons. And I've seen remains. So many remains. A lot of them sages from centuries past, or hapless drifters that must have been desperate for shelter. What fascinates me most are the symbols found on the interior architecture. I can't help but think if we shared notes with other Old, Walled ex old Walls explorers, we might someday decipher the meanings. Icarus forbids exploration of the Old Walls. Did the Tearsmen have similar laws? In typical Younger Realms fashion, entering the Old Walls was never illegal, but plundering them was. The logic being, that which rests in the old walls belongs to your local ruler, not you. Some of your realms, the realms of Azur, Apex, Stalwart, and Haven, are collectively known as the Younger Realms. 
Together, they represent the major political factions of the tiers. I don't know if I've read this before. I'm sure I've read something similar, at least. Uh, for centuries, the younger realms have battled amongst themselves for control of the tiers, with every realm having been at war with each other at some point in memorable history. This lack of unified resistance allowed Kairos' armies to swiftly conquer the tiers. Now, the noble houses made a point of buying up anything that came out of the old walls. Plenty of ancient stuff in there, but sometimes you find stuff that's just a generation old, left by the last fool trying to search for treasure. If you've been through the old walls, you must be familiar with the Bane. More so than is healthy, I've seen one rip a young scribe in half with its nebulous talons, and I've run away from more than my fair share of angry Bane. That sounds redundant. They all seem angry. Heard all sorts of theories on the Bane. Heard they were dead mages. The nightmares of Archons come to life. One sage believes they're Kairos' children. Guess if you have enough ink and parchment, you can crap out any dumb idea. <laughs> I profess to know very little and stick to what can be observed. They appear cunning, but lacking language. They have animal-like qualities, but they seem drawn only to magic and commotion. Food and water seem irrelevant to them. And I'd be happy to oblige. Ever since the fall of the Vellum Citadel, it is hard to find someone with whom I can discuss such things. And what do you know of the spires? History used to say that the order, that the older realms built the spires. These days, your children are repeating that Kairos built them. Guess that's the new history. There are spires all over Tiradis, though I don't know the count. Maybe 40 or so? Five of them are in the tiers, and generally the spires follow the old walls, uh, often occurring at junctions in the old masonry. The mountain spire is a notable exception. The other spires in the tiers connect to the old walls, but the mountain spire is just freestanding, a sore thumb in the middle of the tiers. Any idea as to their purpose? Lightning rod? Perch from which to survey the lands below? Signposts for a society of folks that flew like birds? On this matter, I've only conjecture in flights of fancy. The be best hypothesis I've heard is they are all built at the sites of major settlements now long gone. So maybe their haphazard placement is a hint about how the maps of the old might have looked, or of old. Any idea why magic works better near a spire, or near the spires? The sages liken the phenomenon to heat radiating from a candle. The air is just thicker with magic the closer you get to the spire. It can be deadly, trying to work spells closer to a spire if you aren't wise to the effect. I'd be famous if I could tell you why this happened. I always assumed they are the magical equivalent of river sources. Just as water endlessly flows from certain special sites, so too are there places where magic pours endlessly from a natural source. Any idea who built that structure on top of the mountain spire? Uh, know any sculptors with superhuman strength and the power to fly? If not, I'm out of ideas. Uh, structurally, structurally speaking, it looks vaguely, and I do mean vaguely, similar to the sculptures in the old Academy of Tides. But if that were the case, I think we'd know more. I also noticed notice the, re no, eh. notice the resemblance. I can assure you, if it was built by an old Tidecaster, it was the best kept secret in a school that prided itself on showmanship and boasting about your exploits. Oh, so you studied the art of being insufferable. Here I thought it was a natural gift. Uh, the symbols in the structure certainly look like they could be related to the symbols found in the old walls. So I'm all but certain this that so I'm all but certain that structure was built by the same craftsman that built the spire. And I'd be happy to oblige. I am nothing if not a semi-reliable font of knowledge. Uh, what did you want to discuss? I have questions about our allies and enemies. Well, you might want to ask a more soldierly type about the armies, but do you want to talk about the Archons or other mages? I want to ask you about the Archons. I know much of such luminaries, so I'm careful with my words, but ask if you must. Uh, tell me about Graven Ash, Archon of War. Ash has served with Kairos for a mere century, but he has been a reliable general and level-headed warlord. Certainly when compared to some of the more bloodthirsty Archons to serve under Kairos. I'm not saying the disfavored are merciful, I'm just saying I've read the stories of the Archon of Blood and know it could be worse. I know Graven Ash can defend his soldiers from far away. Ash's Aegis is the term us Arconophiles have taken to calling it. 
Not surprisingly, Graven Ash is beloved by his troops. I mean, if Tunon could mystically protect you from cudgels and sharp sticks from leagues away, you'd like him more. <laughs> and I guess so. Uh, tell me about the voice of Narat, Archon of Secrets. This isn't voice acting, that's weird. Alright. Uh, the voice of Narat is one of Kairos' most dangerous and unpredictable servants. He can pull memories. Whole personalities, if you believe some reports, from his victims and over time. Uh, this has created a single Archon, the knowledge of countless lifetimes. He and I were in written contact as part of the taking of the Vellum Citadel. Though I exchanged very few words with him, it was readily apparent that the voice of Narat doesn't see people, he sees uses. And what do you know of Tunon, Archon of Justice? First, I suppose I should ask what you know of him. See, I don't know if this is an actual rule or not. Uh, he's true to his core mission. He is fair and just. Fair and just by your measure, that is. Tunan, Archon of Justice exists in text spanning back hundreds of years. I can't say I know how he came to be the Overlord's adjudicator. Maybe you know more that... Maybe you know... that one. But he oversaw the conquest of the Tundra Sovereigns. They bowed to Kairos in the year 83. I know anything about Blood and Mark. Archon of Shadows. Very little. His name is not printed in many texts. I know that he has sworn to Tunon and acts as his assassin. I know he goes back a long way, though. I've assumed he's served Kairos about as long as Tunon, give or take. And what of Siren, Archon of Song? Not the youngest Archon in history, but certainly one of the younger, and history has yet to write much about her. And if I happen to be the first to write about her, well, <laughs> that will look nice for my legacy. Uh, did you know Cairn, Archon of Stone? Of him, I know very little. I believe he was the wild man of the hills that Graven Ash subdued in 402, but only one source suggests that link. He's famous for being, well, a big sour jerk. <laughs> Seems he let his mouth run off about Kairos, and that was the end of his story. I am nothing if not a semi-reliable font of knowledge. Uh, what did you want to discuss? Alright, what can you tell me of the School of Ink and Quill? You mean what's left of them? <sighs> what would you like to know? What's the core philosophy of the School of Ink and Quill? The sages are archivists, academicians, and arcanists. Our mission is to preserve the knowledge of today for the good of tomorrow. Though we are known for our magic, few realize that most sages concern themselves with scribal work. Only a select few have the talent or focus to work the sigils. Each sage benefited from the scrolls of learning that came before him, and so each sage must repay this boon by gathering, authoring, or translating new texts to the stacks. But all that's a bit generous. It's no secret that the sages were far more happy to add knowledge than to share it. And why did the sages resist Kairos? Why indeed. As historians, it is our place to document, not direct. Let others rage and resist. Ours is the duty to record. The decision to defy Kairos was not unanimous, nor one decided upon lightly. The laws of Kairos would forbid much of the knowledge contained in the Vellum Citadel. The Elder Sages feared, rightly perhaps, that the Overlord would put an end to our tradition of stockpiling knowledge. The Battle of the Vellum Citadel was a battle to preserve knowledge, but our actions will be remembered as treason against the will of Kairos. Uh, tell me a bit about the school's history. The Sages trace their days to a generation after Five Wives, when the first settlers moved west. The Vellum Citadel began as a scholastic retreat, slowly blossoming into the finest library in the continent across the generations. Five Wives. The Five Wives is the name for both the historic landfall of seafaring human settlers of the Tears, as well as the name for the archipelago where the first, now largely abandoned, settlements were founded. In centuries past, the historic event was known more properly as the Five Wives and the Seven Husbands. For as the story goes, Seven ships made landfall, and after two seasons of difficult living, the seven husbands got back on their boats and see what and see what else was nearby and all perished. Many suggest this was just a, a parable I used to explain the gender roles of land ownership and the admiralty of the tears, 
or in the tears. But the nobility take the origin uh, story quite seriously. And nearly every noble house in the tears has a family mythology linking them back to the, these five fabled matriarchs. The centuries fly by, and suddenly, the Vellum Citadel is the definitive archive in the Tears. The sages branched out into carrying missives for wealthy clients, training noble children to read. The peasants may have feared us, but we remained useful enough to the kings and queens of the Tears to avoid war. When Kairos came to the Tears, that's when our hubris came back to haunt us. The elder sages, the other elder sages, not I, believed our spellcraft was enough to ward off any siege. Well, we know how that turned out. Uh, what sort of sigils did the sages practice? Traditionally, we use magic only so that we may observe and archive. So that means magic of concealment and protection. But in truth, we have amassed a great wealth of knowledge. Before the Vellum Citadel fell, any given subject of magic had at least one sage practicing it. So you're admitting you had at least one agent of yours studying the magic of the Tidecasters? Well, I mean, if such information had fallen into our hands generations ago, we'd be fools not to... Not to suckle off that ill-gotten teat of knowledge? Filthy word whores of the worst degree! Edict of Fire wasn't half of what you deserved. Hmm. I don't know. One or two. Your capacity to hold a grudge is not endearing. Stir your complaints. Or, nah, we'll go the neutral route. I see this conversation going to very constructive places. Both of you, drop it. What would you like to know? I am nothing if not a semi-reliable font of knowledge. Uh, what did you want to discuss? So they say sages know all sorts of things. I know everything, except for who's been saying that. <laughs> What's on your mind? Can you teach me something about history? Well, I'm flattered you think me that wise, but unless you are enthralled by migration observations and titillated by triangle ratios, <laughs> I think I'd bore you silly. I hardly get to use this, so a noble scion. I grew up with books. Try me. Fine, fine. If you have truly nothing better to do than talk trivia with old Landry, so be it. Landry pops up in a scroll case by his hip, producing a long handwritten manuscript. <clears throat> a Brief History of the Tears by Sage Landry. Volume 1, Settlers from the East. Dry land, came the cry from the prow of the ship. After months in the deep ocean, the pioneers of the tears saw their promised land at long last. The minutes roll on, and Lantry's uh, cheerful... The minutes roll on, and Lantry cheerfully reads through his painstaking treatise. What? There's little typos in this. I listen politely. Fascinating. Volume 3. Years 90 to 94. If you thought 88 was a crazy time when everything changed, wait until 91. <laughs> the haunting memories of Tunan's lectures creep into your mind. Listen politely. Really, do go on. Well, if you enjoyed that, you're going to love Ratios of the Sun. So, by using the shadow of a staff at noon as a starting point, I use triangles to show a relation. Unlike Tunon, Lantry cannot kill you for walking out of a lecture. And unlike Tunon, Lantry has, eventually, Lantry has to eventually sleep. You've experienced worse. Or are you two measurements far enough to derive a parallax? Ah! I knew someone would ask that! <laughs> and yes! So here's my proof! Sage winding script shows a relationship between all half-square triangles. Uh, I have a diagram somewhere. Now from time to time the wind picks up. The howling biting freeze offers a momentary respite for the deluge of blather. So is this unique to being on top of a spire? Is that why I couldn't speak to him about all this previously? I assumed it was because we're in a new, I guess, chapter of the game. Huh. So if that's correct, you could estimate almost any length from a known angle. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> way to uh, steal the concluding reveal from me. <laughs> But yeah, that's about the gist of it. 
Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, <clears throat> I think my voice needs rest. Uh, thank you for the rousing conversation. No, thank you for all that extra... I guess just the one point of four that we got, but still. Uh, uh, what? I am nothing if not a... I know everything, except for who's been saying that. <laughs> What's on your mind? I know anything about the Bane. A shame sage cloven claws was reduced to a pile of ash. May knew all that's been written on the subject. Most of what we know is summed up in the, in the name. The full term for them is Mage Bane, and there's a good reason for it. They'll prey on anything that moves. They'll show favoritism toward magically active humans. Tell me about Wisps. Wisps are largely inconsequential by themselves, hardly the menace most associate with the Bane. But these glowing little creatures often follow in the wake of Scourges or other larger Bane. That can make them a real danger. Now what do you know of the Scourges? Rathing masses of sharpened limbs, and quiet as a shadow. Scourges are the most frequently observed type of Bane. Not sure if the most numerous, or just the most likely to attack. Now what can you tell me of the Havocs? Havocs are notable for being territorial. By all accounts, they stick to a chosen location and lurk. And lurk. If you see one, common wisdom is to run. It'll give up chase, eventually, when you find the edge of its... home? Know anything about the Malices? The most troublesome of the Mage Bane are the Malices. Though I've never experienced it, I'm told a Malice can take hold of your waking self, leave you trapped in a dream while it puppets you. If evidence of these creatures didn't predate Kairos, I think the Overlord the only creature pow pow powerful and cruel enough to breed the Malice. Do you know where these creatures come from? They seem to breed in the Old Walls, or at least that is where they exist in the highest concentration. But there seems to be no social interaction amongst the Bane, Bane, not Bane, and no logical mechanism of uh, grinding their privates to make little Banes. Well, I guess that's fitting that I mispronounced that. I know everything, except for who's been saying that. <laughs> What's on your mind? Hey, uh, do you know anything about the Beastmen? My knowledge is largely academic, not to be mistaken for practical. Uh, do you know their origins? The earliest settlers made note of the Beastmen, so they were here before us, but not before the older realms. By all accounts, the tribes do not have record of a time before the Old Walls. So, the logical conclusion is that they arrived after the Old Realms, but before Five Wives. Uh, what of... <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what of the tribes? There have been thousands of tribes throughout history, most dissolved within Acquirement's lifespan. The stronger females branch off and make their own tribes with tougher names. Then the King of Azure rounds you up and puts you to work. The Stonestalkers are the most powerful of remaining tribes, thriving now that Azure has fallen. As for the rest, the old talons of Frozen Cloud, the Troll Hooks, the Kolokar, the Katvanas, the Jaw Snap, all gone, I think. And then there's the Shadow Hunters. They're all but extinct. Stone Stalkers. The largest spanning beast tribe in the entirety of the tiers, the Stone Stalkers of Azur nearly tripled in population during a period of domestication and forced labor and service to the farmers and ranchers of the realm. However, like all beasts, the Stone Stalkers are born wild and yearn to range free, unfettered by humans within their own homeland. In ancient times, the tribe was known as the Meadowkins, but they were denied a name during their centuries of enslavement. In the turmoil created by Kairos' invasion of the Tears and conquest of Azur, the beasts rebelled and won their freedom. Uh, drawn to the enigmatic presence of Cairn, Archon of Stone, the beasts took the name Stonestalkers as their own. After Cairn's defeat when Kairos proclaimed the Edict of Stone on Azur, creating the Stone Sea, the Stonestalkers retreated into the wilds. The humans who have since enroached on their territory have been slaughtered. Uh, what do you know of their minds and mannerisms? They are true to their names and live like beasts. Clothing and artifice seem to have little value to them, whereas rutting and killing are the reason they wake in the morning. But it would be a mistake to think them stupid. Ask any tamer and they'll tell you some stories of their cunning. The beasts are wanting in patience and diplomacy, but they are a clever bunch. Uh, where do their loyalties lie or rest? You'd want to ask the authority, Sage Quillborn. She lived with the Kolokar for a few span, back in 404. Some truly fascinating findings. She noted that every successful tribe has a singular female leader. It's Prima. Right, the leader of a beast tribe, a supremacy almost always held by a female, 
This rank is won and defended through vicious bloodshed. It fights for dominance rather than birthright. Many alphas can exist within a single tribe. Only one can ri rise above the others is Prima. She noted that beastmen show fluid loyalty to new matrons. They adapt well to changing leaders, but they never change the relatively simple but strict hierarchical model. Few beastmen have accepted fealty to Kairos. It would seem the notion of bowing to a person you have not seen in the flesh is insanity. This inability to bow to the Overlord will no doubt doom the species, for Kairos does not suffer such token insults. I know everything, except for who's been saved. Of course, how can I help? The Spires, of course, how can I help? I am nothing if not a... I am just gonna go through this real fast, see if I, I missed not, anything. Don't I think that I did. This took longer than I was expecting, so we're not gonna speak to uh, Eb yet. I am nothing if... <sighs> what would you like? I am not... I know everything! Alright, I guess that's it for him. I'm gonna go back through Barrick's dialogue My Lord real Binder, fast. What can I do for you? Good. Let's move on to another matter. Alright, doesn't look like I missed anything there. So next episode will be us talking probably just to Ebb. And uh, we'll get to know her and learn any lore that she knows. It's pretty insightful though. I did learn a lot of stuff from Lantry there. He had a lot more to say than I thought he was going to, but... It was worthwhile. Alright, in the meantime, I'm going to call it here. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you guys in the next episode.